Kalo. Welcome back to IT the podcast. We're here to talk about watches, time, and how to spend it. I am Andy Green. I'm Felix Schultz. How are you, Andy? I'm very well, Felix. I'm uh, excited as always. Today's guest is uh, a good friend. Really? Um, Pulling that card out early. Pulling it out early. Well, he is, as you'll as you'll hear in the sure, interview that sure, we pre-recorded. Sure. Yep. Um, <laughs> as the as the title indicates, we have George Bamford uh, from Bamford Watch Department amongst. I feel like the, saying uh, Bamford Bam, friends. but I don't, I don't think that's. Is that cool? No, it's not cool. I got to say, it's one of the coolest last names we've had on. Yeah. Okay. Just Next, we've got to get like note. Kevin Powlson. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Um. Maybe not. George Bamford for a lot of people. I think a lot of people know who George Bamford is. If you don't, he's sort of the one of the OG watch customizers mm. of the 21st century, yep. we'll say. Yep. Uh, he's interestingly done a lot of work uh, in an official capacity with a lot of OT, the podcast guest alum, uh, people like Black Badger, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, the Dial Artist, mm. King Nerd. Uh, oh, yeah. We, the yeah, the pieces he's, are all coming together, Andy Green. I know. It's like we've been planning things six months in advance. <laughs> Uh, Spoiler alert: have. We have it. <laughs> so we'll get George on the on the phone in a in a little bit, Felix. But before we do, what have you been liking? Well, yeah, it's it's a, an article that came out uh, over the weekend at time of recording, I believe, and mm-hmm. it's from our good friends uh, at Hadinki, who mm-hmm. are great. And specifically, it's from the one and only Jack Forster. Um. And it's not really an article about watches, which is surprising. Hmm. It's called Three Auction World Cautionary Tales for Watch Collectors. Oh, from Jack as well. Mm. Amazing. Yeah, it's great. He's he's got a George Smiley, uh Lacare quote as a top line. He it's it's full of idiosyncrasy. I love it. But the we'll link it up, of course, as we do with these things. But the top line is he looks at three examples in art, wine, and furniture actually, like sort of um, French uh, Napoleonic era furniture where there have been sort of famous high-level fakes and it's basically sort of busted or uh, shockwaves have been sent through that relevant um, section of the market's auction business. And the point is watches is ripe for that. Like they're mass-produced, they were made at a time when no one cared about sort of, you know, authenticity or future. It's not like they were made to be expensive objects. So you you, you can't sort of compare yeah. it in the same way as like an old master painting or something like that. So it's it's a way of, you know, Jack Forster sort of not so subtly saying, there are, you know, the, the auction market for watches could well be flooded with fakes but everyone's invested in it sort of not becoming a thing. Like if you have spent 200 Gs on a Rolex, you don't really want to know that it's not legit. That's interesting because we've talked about the wine counterfeiting uh, thing before in the past. I think I sent you like a 10-year-old article in the New York yeah, Times. Yeah, and, and they, they referenced a guy. So there was a doco called Sour Grapes on, on Netflix yeah, yeah, yeah. That, they, that he brings up. And it's and it's it's so, there's so many parallels between watches and um, wine, I reckon. It's, it's a good read. And I think, yeah, like the watch, the secondary watch auction market, especially for those super high-level stuff, it can't go on forever. There's got to be someone, someone's got to get busted who's, you know, been dealing them for 30 years and has, will be found to have been systematically faking all of them, something like that, and it'll all come crashing down, I reckon. Calling it All right, well, I'll have the legal team stand by for the... um... (laughs) Defamation on this uh, this episode. (laughs) But you know what I mean. It's going to happen. And officially I'm distancing myself from uh, from Felix Schultz. Yeah, I I, I didn't Uh, give you a heads up on that hot take, by the way, did I? You're like... (laughs) Jeez, you're just going after them. You're going after them. I'm not... I'm just, you know... You're not pulling any punches. You know I'm right. You know I'm right. Yeah, you didn't give him any heads up, and something I've been liking is also from Hodinky. So, <gasps> what, what, mate, what what are you? I mean, we should have planned this. We should have. Uh, we've been too busy planning our, our future six months in liking? advance. This this is an article by uh, another uh, OT alum, James Stacey. It's oh. called "How to How to Clean and Care for Your Watch Straps." Now, Ooh. what makes this for me? What makes this article for me is the sort of subheading that he's used. Oh, he kills on subheadings. They're always great. Are you ready? Yeah. Nobody likes a sloppy strap. 
<laughs> love it. Uh, I love it. He did. A, is this a follow up to his? Uh, can we say infamous article on how to clean your watch that that copped yep. hiding on? Yeah, social? it's the follow up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So this is part two. Does he address? Do you, does he does he own it or does he just like go straight in there? Oh yeah, it's at the start. He he acknowledges it. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But he takes you through how to clean a leather strap, NATO's, nylon straps, uh, and rubber straps, which is which is handy. And I think a lot of people don't even realize that you can, you know, Do this clean a, a NATO strap um, at the very least, let alone leather straps and all this other stuff. But it does make a difference. Um, I remember watching a guy, I don't know, five or six years ago, saying he put his NATO straps in his jean pocket or his pant pocket through the wash, uh, and that's how he did it. And I thought, oh, that's a, that's a good idea, but it does reinvigorate uh, those straps. Yeah, I've got a... Um... One of my favourite straps ever. It's a it's a twenty two millimeter uh, ring Zulu that I, I love. You know, you should, uh-huh. and I've had it for over ten years now. And I just yeah, I, I give it a wash. I I sort of put it in. It's just you know, it's nylon. You can't stuff it up. Bloody hope so. Uh, all right, I haven't well, read it. Maybe I've been doing it wrong. James, please. There you go, Hodinki. Uh, enjoy the uh, the influx of traffic. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm sure it'll be Crash huge. Side. Yeah. Again. Uh, it's going to be Rolex. It's going to be September one. Rolex is uh, all over again. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So we need to take a break. We, we have do. a uh, we have to sponsor. We have a sponsor. We have to talk about, and then we're going to come back. We're going to get George on the phone. Today's episode of OT the podcast is brought to you by our wunderbar sponsors, Nomos Glasute. Nomos is one of Germany's best watch brands, and it's one very special to me and Andy. I'm wearing my Nomos Club Automat as we speak, and it's the most sentimental watch I own. I've had it engraved, and it's not going anywhere. Nomos has only been around since 1990, and they've certainly achieved a lot in the last 30 years. But watchmaking has a longer history in Glasuta. It's been a part of the town for 175 years now, and Nomos is celebrating the anniversary with a quite cool limited edition. If you caught episode 37 with Neil Ferrier from Discommon in it, you'll have heard us talk in more detail about the brand new Nomos Lambda in steel. I've actually been wearing the white enamel dial around for a little while now. We'll have more Nomos chat in the coming weeks. The Lambda is a special watch in their collection, refined, dressy, and with a beautiful movement. Absolutely. Here's the top line, Andy. There's three dial options, white, blue, and black. Super impressive 84 hours of power reserve, or 3.5 days. The power reserve indicator is front and center on that dial. It's also got a sleeker 40.5 millimeter case, which is down from the 42 mils of the previous gold models. It's not often you find this level of high-end watchmaking in steel and not at this price point. Because make no mistake, this is a high-end movement. The caliber is a DUW1001. It's beautifully done traditional German watchmaking. There's a big three-quarter plate with fine sunbeam polishing and Nomos perlage, gold chatons, as well as a hand-engraved balance cock inscribed with lovingly produced in Glashütte. In German, of course. I think it's perhaps Nomos's most pretty movement and well-suited to celebrating this anniversary. Who's this for, Felix? Well, being in steel, it's priced competitively and hard-wearing. The movement is also top-notch. It would work well for someone who wants a sleek, minimal design as their daily or a collector looking for something special. For me, though, this new steel turns the Lambda from a special occasion watch into an everyday one. Andy, what's it like on? Yeah, so it's light and lovely on the wrist. The strap is really comfortable. Love the smaller case size. It wears well. It's 0.1 thinner than those precious metal options. The strap itself is delightful. It's got this winged clasp, which is an extra spot of clasp on the clasp. The movement is a treat to look at. Uh, As we've been talking about, this watch really is about the movement. Also, some extra props to the packaging. Fine leather wallet, super soft, full grand leather. Lets your watch lie flat, not rolled up, buckled into place, doesn't move anywhere. No need to worry about zips or buckles or anything like mm. that. Love it. And how about the price, Andy? All right. It's a scaled down steel in steel, which is a huge deal. You're looking at 10,400 Australian dollars, 5,800 euros or 5,800 pounds sterling or 7,500 United States dollars. And remember, each dial limited to 175 pieces. Lambda stands for precise legibility and precision timekeeping. Visit nomos glasutacom that's nomos-g-l-a-s-h-u-e-t-t-e.com to see the new steel lambda for yourself and to make your wrist the center of attention. Thank you, Nomos. Now, let's get back to the show. And we're back, Felix. Uh, great sponsor, as always. Nomos, thank you. It is time to call George. Let's Bamford. not waste any time. Uh, let's get George on the line. It's a big one. 
Felix. Yes, and Grant. Today's guest is none other than George Bamford, founder of Bamford Watch Department, mega car enthusiast, major watch lover and friend of OT, and he's also the epitome of a gentleman. Founded in 2006, Bamford Watch Department was the leading age of watch customization and has transitioned from some sort of clandestine service to the now mainstream. And it's the, at the point where Bamford Watch Department is an official partner with LVMH. On top of that, George has also stepped back into the family business. So we'll talk about that. But I think we, we should get into it and hear all about customized watches and what's important to him. George, great to have you on the show. And it, great to ha- oh, great to speak to you. Um, this is kind of a, a new a new format, and I'm so so pleased to be on this with you guys. Um, I, I I I love that intro. I'm like, God, I feel I feel very honoured to have that intro. Um, oh, that's, and, that's uh, fair. Well, thank you very much. I, I, thank I, you. I, 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 and also, I, I do I, I love that you know our friendship has 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 kind of built over so long and mm. we've kind of only met each other probably two or three times, but I, I consider you a good friend. So it's kind of, it's one of those kind of wonderful, crazy things that uh, social media has kind of got us a lot closer. And especially in these times, it's got us a lot closer. Yeah. Back at you, George. And I'm glad you liked the intro. I, I spent a little bit of time writing it last night and, and yeah, totally, uh, you know, can relate. I oh. agree on, on every level with you, mate. Um, it's good to talk. You know, usually we'd probably catch up a couple of months ago. Um, yeah. But for the listeners who don't know you as well as I do, you've been ahead of the game when it comes to sort of that deep customization of watches. You know, you started Bamford Watch Department however many years ago now, you know, nearly two decades. Um, how has the space changed since you got into it and how has your business changed? So I would say to you, um, we started off and uh, – I was kind of banging the drum of customization and personalization. And a lot of people were like going, well, why would you, why would you want that? You, you know, you want to standardize, you yeah. want a standardization. Um, and now personalization has, is coming hand in hand with luxury personalization. But it, it also is something not new. If you actually look at personalization, mm. personalization, you know, goes back to early days. I mean, Louis Vuitton, started off by giving you a personalized luggage um uh, you know that you would go and have a steamer trunk so then you could travel to the africa and and everything was personalized to you uh you know 1920s ev- every single thing that you would have on your 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 uh, body it would be like you know your suit your shirt your glasses your watch your po- sorry your pocket watch everything was personalized mm. so i think personalization is not a new thing even black. I mean, I'm known for blackening out watches. Black is not new. Mm. I mean, you know, for me, I, I, I'm not, I, I, I'd love to say I've kind of revolutionized or done something else. And I'm, I, I, I'm, some people call me a punk and other people kind of go, oh, what the hell have you done? Um, but what I would say to you is I look at personalization as giving someone that individual voice. We are living in a mass market luxury world and everything is, is, is kind of, you know, next, 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 and I want to, I, I want to conform. Now, I, I, I was one of these people that I don't love following the herd. You know, I love collecting the weird and wonderful watches. I love going to experiences that are different. I mean, and, and you know, we we discussed um, uh, earlier, but I'll bring it up here. The IWC have just done a new personalized experience that's online, and it's going to be that you can have a virtual tour of the of Schaffhausen mm. of their their facility now how cool is that that's basically bringing a personalization into a, a, into your your kind of vision now i love that and i i think that's where you know when you look at brands they they are trying to get you to fall in love with the brand but personalize your experience with the brand you know you buy that watch for you know i i always remember someone saying I've I've personalized this watch because it is for my wedding day and I want to remember mm. that day and every single time I look at that watch it's going to be reminding me of my wedding day and I think well we always personalize our shopping experience or our buying experience we don't you know instantly go oh my god I've got to buy that watch because I've got to buy it I, you know you buy it because you go mm-hmm. oh I've made this money I've done this or I've done this I want this watch. And, you know, you'd spend time looking. Well, that's my experience. And I think, you know, what I'm doing is I'm taking it one step further. 
Yeah, I love that. And I think that's a really interesting perspective. And you are right that, you know, you are, I think Bamford is, is pretty, uh, pretty famous for sort of that blackout look to watches, obviously, you know, brands like Zinn and uh, Hoyer and, and that sort of thing did it, you know, very early on in like the 1970s. But I think you really brought it into the mainstream. And I think we can credit um, Bamford with that. And what I find really interesting is the shift from, you know, this sort of trepidation that collect the collector community specifically had, I think early on, call it 15 years ago. And you've gone from a, that that sort of uh, point bad of being boy, a bit of a... Bad boy of the watch you know, business. Yeah, on the, a bit of a punk, a bad boy on the outskirts to, you know, you've got a partnership with LVMH. You're doing, you know, limited editions with that, that sell out, let me say, with Tag Hoyer. You're doing... Uh, you recently did one with Zenith, the superconductor. You're doing Bulgari, just to name a few. How does that feel to kind of have travelled so far in 15 years? Um, it feels... I, 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 I mean, to answer you, I've got a big grin on my face. I mean, I, I've, I've come out of the shade and I'm into the sun. Um, look, mm-hmm. I, I would say to you, so uh, working with LVMH, working with caring groups of so the GP and... Uh, the uh, and Ulysses Nada. Sorry, I'm not allowed to say that, but yes, there is another brand. Um, uh, but working with a caring yes. group as well, um, and potentially some other cool. other watch brands. Um, you know, it has been absolutely amazing. Uh, I think the, the writing on the writing is on the wall of personalization, and I think you know, watch brands are going to be doing personalization. We know this already. Uh, and a lot of brands have already started doing it. Tiffany's did it. Um, uh, um, Bomb or Bomb Marcier, but uh, Bomb um, mm. did their personalization. Um, Omega uh, started off doing personalization with their NATO straps and some of their modifications. IWC are already giving you a personal experience. I mean, I went yesterday, uh, two days ago, I went to Zurich and I, I saw their brand new IWC racing inspired store, car racing inspired store. And, you know, the straps, the whole experience, um, period correct, did all the packaging for stuff and did special stripes. And, Very cool. You know, and everything was was an experience. And I think that's, I think personalization is going hand in hand. I think brands are going going that way. So I, I look at it and I think, you know, I could I could be like, um, and I I always use this uh, terminology, and and it was the terminology by um, someone that I kind of considered my mentor, my almost the god, and he is the god of of watches. Is Jean Claude Beaver said to me? He said you could be like Kodak, but Kodak today has kind of changed. It's now become a pharmaceutical business, but you could be like Kodak. The watch world is moving to personalization. You could either be a relic and carry on doing whatever you're doing or be a part of the solution. And that's what's happened today is, you know, I, as soon as Jean-Claude came into my office and asked me, I was just like, Oh my God, you know, it's like almost like the crescendo um, sound. Yeah, that's amazing. Like, I mean, you know, we've had the sort of the pleasure of meeting uh, Mr. Beaver a few times and it's uh, for me, certainly he's got that, um, a presence about him, like you, you feel so, so sort of special when he's in the room. I was wondering, though, you know, you started off being this sort of anti-establishment punk, and you've moved into, you know, firmly in the mainstream. You're, you know, you're hanging out with uh, JCB and all this sort of stuff. Um, is there anything you miss about those old days of, you know, customizing watches and sort of doing it on your own? No. Right, right. That that sounds really bad. No, I, do you know why? Is I before I had to go around and try and, um, you know, I had to figure out how things were made. I had to figure out what mm. what was happening. It was a lot of voyage of mm. discovery. Now, you know, like like with the Black Badger. Um, so with James from Black Badger, we we've just done the superconductor case. I just phoned up the head of um, design at uh, Zenith and said, "Could I have a three D CAD of of a uh, El Primero case?" <laughs> Love that. You know what I find really interesting, George, is that you know you were you were this black sheep for so long in in that part of the industry, albeit you know really successful with the sort of work you were doing in the shadows. But 
I, you know, every now and then I kind of hop online to try and find one of those pieces, you know, from your early days. And I think it was the Bamford and Sons before it was officially Bamford yeah. Watch Department. And you really don't see these pieces popping up, you know, on the pre-owned market or the secondhand market. And when you do, they're not, you know, at, you know, what, what people would think at a discount price, like they're at premiums because they are special mm-hmm. and they are unique and they are customized. But that talks to, you know, the the market. But what I really like is the people that clearly bought these watches have hung on to them. And it sort of goes back to your earlier point of the, you know, that special experience of customize something and making it your own. You know, when you do that, you don't expect to see it ever pop back up. So I think that that's a, you know, a really cool part of the history of Bamford Watch Department. Well, thank you. I, I'm going to ask a weird question to both of you. What's what what on your wrist, yeah. both of you? Right now, I'm wearing a, a Rolex uh, GMT Master II, the, the Batgirl, so on the Jubilee oh, bracelet. I've, nice. I've gone okay. uh, the other end of the spectrum yeah. with a very uh, colourful pink and purple Casio G-Shock that has been customised by our friend the Dial Artist. Oh, I love I love the Dial Artist. He, he <laughs> rocks. Okay, well, look, I... I, I... Then I'm, I'm, I, my, my question doesn't work as well, but Felix... Firstly, G-Shock, how cool does that feel when you put it on your wrist and you wear it and someone goes, oh, my God, yeah, that's, that's cool. I, like, I've got heap, heaps of other watches sitting around, but I'm just finding myself wanting to wear this because it's it's fun and it's cool. Yeah. And it's different as well. Wow. So that, for me, is um, – Andy, I'm sorry that I'm kind of uh, only be, <laughs> doing something else that's different, but, you know, I, I look at – Felix's watch, and I want. I want. I. I would like to nick Felix's watch over your watch. I have one too, George. I've got. I've got a camo uh, job done on a on the green Casio. And that's the cool. Do you know what I mean? Is that's the, the um, and yeah. it's like I was wearing a Solnar um, Hoyer, so vintage Ooh. Hoyer. Yes, and I absolutely loved it. I, I love it. it. It's one of my favorite watches, and I wore it, and I've put a post up on social media for. Um, what was it? Uh, 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 weekend wrist shot, and I just put it up, and I was mm-hmm. just like, I just enjoy this watch. The amount of messages saying, "Can I have that watch? I want to buy that watch. How much wow. would you sell it?" And I was like, "No, no, it's not for sale." I mean, even someone offered me like stupid amounts, and I went to her and said, "Go on Chrono Twenty Four, go and find it." Um, you know, it took me <laughs> ages to find it. I, you know, go and find it, and that's the thing is, you know, if I'd put up something else. It, it wouldn't have got the same reaction. People want something mm. different. They want to be different in this world. They want to have that different experience. And I think that's where I look at look at this as, you know, personalization. You know, when you you've both said about the dial artists, we've also said about James at Black Badger. You know, when you look at these things, we are now. You know, do we want to be a sheep or do we want to actually be someone mm. that's having our own view? You know, I love sneakers and I kind of love when, you know, someone comes in a pair of sneakers and I'm like, oh, my God, I love those trainers. They're not my style, but, God, they suit him. Mm. You know, instead of, like, all of us generically the same. So, George, I was going to ask you what what you love about the customization process, but I think we've answered that. So what I'm going to ask you is why, and I know the answer to this, but the listeners will love hearing this, why did you start Bamford Watch Department in the first place? Oh, um, I, I, I know that you know the answer. For me, it was, um, I, well, the first watch I, I customised that uh, is a very interesting thing is I customised a Monaco. Uh, because, uh, cool. And the reason why I customised a Monaco is I got, um, I got given it. Um, uh, I was doing a car um, rally and um, we won and the gift was a Monaco. And I was, I was passenger with my father, and my father had won it. Um, and he said to me, he said, uh, George, uh, for being my passenger and putting up with all the experience, why didn't you take the watch? And I was like, this is the coolest thing. And I wore it and wore it and wore it. And, and then individuality didn't happen. So what I mean is I, I, I loved it, but it started losing that kind of unique feel. So, so I customized it. Um, but I know what you're asking about is how did I start in this world Mm. and how I started, basically I used to go to flea markets and trade watches 
and I was living in New York and I used to go back and forth and trade watches. So I used to go um, to New York. So I was, I was living in New York and I used to go to those flea markets and I'd go, oh my God, there's a prowl cloth or a, um, uh, a bullhead or, a, and I used to just mm. go and experience and then I'd change it over to a NATO strap or a leather strap or, or I'd, and then I'd trade it the, the next weekend with another flea market guy and I'd, I'd have a Monaco or I'd have a, um, I don't know, I'd, I'd have a Speedmaster or I would have, I don't know, um, Zenith El Premier. And I'd, I'd literally be trading. And that was kind mm. of how I, I, I loved about personalization. But I realized that changing a strap, buying a strap and, and putting it on a watch, you could upgrade the price by just changing one thing. And that's mm. kind of how it started. But you know, I can take you further back. I got given a Breitling Navitimer in 1996, of all things. And I know it's 1996 because it's Very engraved cool. on the back. My father gave it to me uh, for Christmas. Now, I'm I'm quite dyslexic and, and I'm, I'm kind of one of these ever, um, ever engineers that... Um, so I come from an engineering family and I, I'm, I love engineering. So as a kid, I used to take things like our, our juicer to bits and the TV to bit <laughs> and things like that. And I used to put them back together. And I'm an early bird. So I, I it was about 4.30 every morning. I used to go downstairs and, and, my, and my parents hated it in the morning because like I would take a restrictor off the juicer and it would like literally the orange, orange juice would be done in about two seconds or some of the time would have been taken <laughs> off. It's kind of one of those things. Anyway, um, Christmas, I got given a Brightening Navitimer. Um, Boxing Day, I'd already taken it to bits. Um, no. And I'd taken it to bits because I wanted to understand how it worked. And that was in 1996. And I had a, a glasses screwdriver and a pen knife. And that was how I got into the watch. And that was my first experience. And, you know, I, I have that crescendo moment with a, a Brightening Navitimer is, it really gave me that love affair. And, you know, my watchmakers here, I'm in the Hive, so I'm in, I'm in Mayfair. And my watchmakers always take the piss out of me. Even over lockdown, they, they, um, they did a few videos um, and they said, oh, George has just sent us some, uh, some things to work on a watch. And I think it was a hammer and a big screwdriver. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I am heavy handed. And the Brightling Navitimer went back uh, to Brightling um, I'd probably say by the summer because the the chrono function didn't work and the waterproofness didn't work. And then I took it again to bits and then I broke the glass and then, you know, and all these different things. But I, I was learning. There was no YouTube of how to disassemble a watch. I just wanted to disassemble mm. it and put it back together. Um, but I put it back together. I mean, by New Year, it was back together. Did it work as well? Was it timing as well? No. But Jesus Christ, that kept my kept my parents very very happy because I didn't attack the TV. The um, probably it was a VCR in those days. Uh, I didn't uh, I didn't attack anything else in the house. I hadn't gone to a car and taken an engine to bits or anything like that. So I think my father thought that was the best Christmas present he'd ever given me. It was like you know, you give your kids a, a Lego or, or a puzzle for Christmas. Um, that's kind of what my father did to me. The ultimate distraction, and that's quite amazing that you managed to get it, you know, running uh, again. Like that's that's a testament to, you know, that sort of knack, I guess. So I, I can probably take you back. I I um, I come from a family of construction, um, co uh, well, construction company uh, called JCB, and that's Yellow Diggers. So I, my sure. my grandfather was an engineer. My father's an engineer, um, and. So the age of eight, I, I learned how to weld um, and yeah. I stripped an engine, rebuilt it about nine, eight, eight or nine. So when I'm saying to you is putting something back together, I, I, I kind of, you know, I had an instructor at those times of, you know, hey, this is what you do. So I kind of learned um, mm. now putting it back together. Now, there were a few parts that were missing. So I would say to you, is that, and probably there's a few things that flung on my my bedroom floor. Um, I, I I remember pulling the sheet off my uh, off my bed, my white sheet, and putting it on the floor and having the watch there whilst I was taking to bits, and Good you know, and trying to kind of. But I was sitting cross legged on the floor. Yeah, so you, you've got, you've yeah, got a yeah. vision of a, a small George kind of 
screwing around with watches. Yeah. I mean, I, I can relate to that. Certainly I've had, you know, remote control cars when I was a kid, but uh, where you're different is that you seem to be able to put them back together, whereas mine just ended <laughs> up in a pile of bits. I, um, I, I think the people at Breitling would have kind of uh, said to me no. Um, but <laughs> what I would also say to you is uh, it was 200 quid. I, um, I asked my father a few years ago how much he paid, and he showed me the receipt, and it was 200 pounds. And it was a black dial, Breitling Malata. I still got it to this day, and it's still got all the marks, cool. dents. Bang. You're going to have to send us a picture. Um, I will definitely send you a picture. And for me, it, that it was one of those experiences as a watch that I loved. I'm going to try and find so it George, now. Yeah, do. Yeah, send us a shot. So, George, as Andy sort of said a little while ago, you're kind of the guy that put PVD on the map. And, you know... Back then, the PVD maybe wasn't as uh, advanced as it was, but it was it was cool. It was like something you know you didn't really see, especially on some of those sports models. Yeah. Um, what's changed in the last fifteen years in terms of sort of trends in customization? Where are we now? I think we. So it started with just black, and yeah. you know, black was the black was like, oh yeah, can I get a black watch? Now it's about, it's about, can I get that with my, uh, I mean, we, we've had some wonderful requests, uh, through lockdown. Um, you know, mm. so as someone, um, we've just done a beautiful dial for a customer where, um, it's got his racing silks, um, but it's actually got a horse on the bottom of the uh, dial. Um, Cool. And it looks so retro cool and it and the colours so suited. And the guy um just emailed us and said, Hey, this is what I'd love, this is what the and we were with the design team and it was back and forth on personalization. And and we were saying, Do you want a coating? Do you want this? Do you want and he said, No, no, I want it to look almost stock, but you just see two little things that are so individual that people know it's mine. And I just thought, That's cool. actually, so sometimes it's not, it, it's almost the subtlety of reduction and it, and someone just goes, I just want this and this to make it mine. Um, hmm. And, and that's, you know, and, and I think sometimes, you know, when we talked about black badger, um, you know, like, let's say, let's take the coffee dial that we did together. Hmm. That coffee dial was awesome now we could have been all singing, all dancing. We could have put loom everywhere. We could have we we could have really mucked around with everything, and every option was there. And basically, almost the pairing back and having that wonderful chocolate coffee dial, of course, but that real kind of tobaccoy look to the dial with the strap, mm. with with the cream accents or the cappuccino accents. Really, for me makes the watch come alive yeah so so it's less overt these days it's the sort of thing that you need to take a second look at to realize that it's a a one-of-a-kind piece maybe yeah um, uh, look, so, some, something else some, sometimes you know and and, and yeah, okay. you know we, we've got the fordite that's totally opposite that really is crazy 70s style mm. You know, James and I see things differently when we look at the dial. Like he's going, the dial looks like this, this, this looks like this. But actually, we both are going, it's so cool on color. But we want mm. the dial to mm. pop on that Carrera. You know, and great thing about, you know, the Ford, uh, um, you know, came out of Ford. So, you know, Carrera, modern Carrera has got a vintage Ford inside. And you kind of go, how freaking cool is that? And then you look at the crazy colours coming through it and you just say, this is awesome. So do you think that it's – it's maybe it's not that sort of uh, discretionary customization. Maybe it's more uh, how you incorporate a story into a watch to make it special, whether it's the Fordite, you know, paint off the, off the floor over 25 years or the coffee dial. Do you think that that's what – people are sort of now after it's sort of incorporating a story and whether it's for a limited edition and it's sort of 
you know, it's a small batch and it's special or it's, you know, one of one unique piece through your customization servers. Is it incorporating a special story? No, I, I, well, look, I think everything is a special story. Even when you go and buy a watch, it's a special experience. Mm -hmm. You know, the watch that's on your wrist that you go, I want to buy that because I've got this. There's a story behind it. So when you're saying Mm -hmm. about a special story, I don't think it is. I just think it is about, you know, having having you represented you know there is a lot of people that have got a lot of money out there there was and you know they've got amazing taste and Mm -hmm. they want to personify themselves you know even even Mm -hmm. down to different clothing i'm sure all of us are wearing different style of clothes today um you know and different way how we wear it so we we are really all all already putting our foot first and saying this is how we present ourselves so i think it's more saying we care how do we care how do you know and band for watch you know we have a motto in the business is our customers can get on without us we cannot get on without them so we care about every every element and and you know doing the things with james uh black badger or you know, I know that you've uh, uh, got Johnny from King Nerd. You know, those projects that we we do, it's I'm working with like-minded people that really care. And, you know, you said I was allowed to swear, give a shit. Go for it. You know, people that <laughs> give a shit. You know, people that really care about delivering something that is unique, is personalized, is something that you know, and really actually care about doing something. And that's why I work with these guys. You know, there's only, I would say to you is, um, if you looked on the um, GB Asks, those are the people that care. You know, these are the people that are really pushing and caring about what's happening in the industry, from Nick Fox. There was an Aussie guy on there, wasn't uh, there? Uh, a weird one, wasn't there? <laughs> it's a podcast or something. No, but Some you care. Like, you, yeah. Look, you wouldn't do this if you didn't care about the industry. And that's that's yeah. what I look at is that we're all care and caring, and we're caring that this industry is is done in the right way. We're caring about everything, and I'm one little clog cog. I you know I always say to the brands, and you know as soon as I started with Tag Heuer, I said the same thing. I said I am literally a probably one little flake of sugar on the top of a cupcake of the Tag Heuer business. So I'm literally that mm. little thing so don't you know i'm not this kind of oh my god i but i but i'm having fun and we're having fun together and that's where i look at look at my business is you know we are such a small little voice but i want people to see that we're passionate about what we do you know working with jerry perigo i love the brand i love what they're doing and why did we launch with the cat side because we had a request from our clients um, and we had two uh, two ladies that was that said we haven't got a watch for us, you know. My husband's come in and seen you, and what's for us? And we showed them three or four watches. We we had some Bulgari and we had some other things, and they said no, 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 no. What's for us? And then we saw the Jerry Perigo cat's eye, and the ladies, both ladies, and this was a, a different experience. We we were emailing, we we're chatting. And both of them said, oh, my God, I love it. Can I have it? And one of them wanted, um, uh, so uh, Dial Artist helped us out and did an amazing pink and blue crazy dial. And then we then there was also a star dial as well. And each one was so individually done. And Dial Artist, I mean, he, he's a rock star because he really works in such a fine way. And I thought that kind of coming together and giving someone something that they'd like. And chatting to um, Shara Perigo, they were just like, hell yes, let's work with you. We'd love to. And for me, it was like almost my hands up in the air going, wow. So, George, um, you've sort of, you've you've touched on it in a few ways. You know, you've sort of got people with very individual and different requests coming at it from different places. This is one of those uh, hard, you know, those typical questions to answer. Is there a a regular or or standard BWD um, department customer? Is there a standard? No, 
uh, I would love to say, you know, it ranges from, I mean, our youngest customer probably is about 13. Um, cool. We've got a, a very, very cool customer uh, that's 13 and, he, and he's done one or two really cool, crazy pieces. Uh, we've got some tech entrepreneurs. We've got uh, some uh, I, we never talk about our clients and, and I, I'm sitting in my office and I wished I'd, I could show you, but I couldn't, I've got, it's the only place where you will see photographs of our clients wearing our watches. Uh, but what I would say to you is we, we, we've got some amazing clients, um, from all ages, all, you know, I, I mean, our oldest client is probably about 87 now. Um, wow. and you know, and just wants to have something that is u- unique to him. You know, he spent all this time, you know, wearing a standard watch. And he just went, you know, I'm old enough now. I just don't give a monkeys. I want to have something for me. I want to look at it every morning and smile. And for me, that's cool. That is very cool. The follow-up question to this, I think, is in terms of the, the customization side of it, do you ever have to say no to what people want? Oh, okay. I have... I, 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 uh, the best way to describe it is I've, I have to try and persuade. Sure. So I have Mm -hmm. to try and persuade someone not to do something. Uh, Mm -hmm. and I tried, uh, so there was a color combination that I thought would not work. And it was Mm -hmm. pink and green. The two colors together, I was just like, you must be bloody joking. And I'm wow. swaying back and forth to this customer. I was like, you must be joking. This does not work together. Um, and I was really quite, can I, can I show you this? Can I show you this? Can I show you this? Can we, can I do this? Can I do this? And every time I was doing it, the customer was just like, please just do it. And it was about a month, month and a half. And it really, when I saw it on the screen, it didn't work. Yeah, we got it into the office, and the whole watch came together. And I thought, God, this color combination works. It looks so, yeah. it, it pops in the right way. It really rocks. And I, I, I was just like, Oh, you must be joking. And the customer just went to me and said, Please get this photographed. And I was like, Yes. So I photo, we photographed it. And he said, um, I want you to have uh, a framed image up on your wall, just to remember that the customer's always right. <laughs> I would 100% I get a, gr- a green and that. pink watch. That's cool. So Amazing. what I'm saying to you is from that point on, it made me realize that the customer is right. And, it, and but uh-huh. look, if the if it doesn't look good, um, you know, and the customer's not happy, within the first couple of weeks, send it back and we'll redo it. We want them to be yeah, happy cool. and show it off and wear it and love it. Mm-hmm. And and in that in that process, do you sort of like uh, this is sort of maybe a, a, a bit nuts and boltsy, but like as you're you're getting the, the the watch put together, will you sort of send images and say, "Hey, this is what the case color looks like. This is what the hands look like." Is it that consultative, or is it a bit more Look, it, it, the, wait until the final product? There's there's multiple multiple ways which talking to customers some of them is very granular so you know we we will take it through the whole process and some customers are just like so six weeks i'm getting my watch and you're like yes okay perfect um uh send it to me in six weeks that's it boom you know so done the design i mean the shortest consultation on a watch design has been three minutes and the longest consultation has been a year and a half Wow. Okay, George. So you mentioned you've got a 13 year old customer. I know you have a son. Is there any relationship to this 13 year old customer that you're talking about? Do your kids ask you for special watches? Uh, How do you handle that? Uh, so, uh, at the moment, uh, my daughter is wearing a, uh, formula one, uh, uh, an old formula one. Uh, she, I think hers is a pink formula one. Um, cool. and she's uh-huh. at rocking it and she loves it. Uh, my son, uh, is kind of mixture. So he's, he, he, he is, he is rocking a few watches. Um, he spent some time up with watchmakers, um, and he's taken a watch to bits himself now. Um, and he, 
you know, he's he is a rock star on on kind of understanding about engineering. Um, him and I on the weekend, I've got an old MGB engine that I strip and rebuild because my wife said to me that we need to do yoga, um, and I brought an engine to do my yoga. <laughs> so, um, uh, and but my son, I mean, even uh, so, when we're looking at what I'm wearing, um, you know, my son or my daughter will say that watch doesn't go with that daddy. And I'm like, yeah, but it, I think it does. And they're like, no, no, you need something a bit more, you know, so it, it, it's kind of like, uh, I, I don't know, I'll bring out a Hoya Kentucky and they'll be like, yeah, it doesn't work with what you're wearing. You should wear that with a suit. You should be wearing a, I don't know, um, uh, a, a, what did I wear recently? I, I wore a, um, uh, a Luminor, a, a, a Panerai and, and my, my son was like, yeah, that's perfect for what you're wearing. Knucky didn't work. So, you know what I mean? Is that's the kind of great thing is that they, they really are caring about what, what works. And it's not about price. It's not about, you know, yep. they're, they're just, com- and it's what I, I believe is the aesthetic. It's the design aesthetic. It's the shape. It's the colorway. You know, that's what I look at. If it's 500 cool. quid, if it's, you know, five hundred thousand pounds. It doesn't matter. It's more. Is it something I I love? Is it something I would I would love to love to wear? I mean, I, I'll do a for instance of uh, um, a client just messaged me this morning, and so I'm just going to repeat repeat the message from this client. Uh, um, just so then you can hear me say something. Uh, which one is it? think it's that oh yes um do you think this limited edition um uh watch um and it's it's uh it's actually a beautiful watch um i'm not telling you the brand because it seems like i'm i'm one of the adverts for this brand um <laughs> and i've mentioned them a few times and it begins with i um uh, uh do you think uh, the uh the watch will hold or increase its value uh i i basically put back wow i don't know but I, I, but I love it. Um, what do you think? Um, if you like it, then who cares as wear it and enjoy it? Amen. 100%. Amen. I love that. I'm going to ask you about your personal wearing um, a little bit later on. But what I want to hear about is something else we've been talking about, and that's collaboration. Now, you're a very collaborative fella. You know, we've talked about Black Badger, James yeah. Thompson. You guys have been having a blast together. We, we spoke to him recently yeah. about the Superconductor. And we're hearing, you know, murmurs that there might be some other pretty big projects in the work, but works between you two oh, yeah. and sort of scientists. What can you tell oh, us? Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. You wanted me to respond to that. Sorry. I, I'm just like, <laughs> um, uh, there's, there's, there, look, we, we are definitely having fun. Uh, this is, uh, Superconductor was meant to be launched at Christmas um, uh, this year, last year. Um, and we delayed it. Um, the, we have got probably, um, another two projects this year that we're launching. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of them is totally out of the, out of the park in some way. Um, I discovered something in my office, um, something I, I brought a while ago, uh, actually probably, before we moved to this office. So we've been in this office five years. So uh, in my old office, I brought uh, a, ser- a, a set of movements because uh, I was going to build my own watch. And mm-hmm. anyway, they got they got lost. And anyway, found them in the attic. And James and I are doing a project uh, with with them. And this is and the whole story for me is just crazy. And James and I have just kind of gone, actually, hell yes, let's do it. It's a limited edition of only, I think it's 18 pieces because we've only got 19 mm-hmm. movements. And you have to keep one? Hell yes. No, no, no. I'm, 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 I, I, I kind of want all 18, but, you know, um, <laughs> but it, it's crazy. And so that's one of the projects. And then there's another project as well. Um, and most of the, the two next projects we, we were talking about in January, uh, Christmas, we were talking about the movement idea. Um, and basically through lockdown, I was like, you know, uh, 
I hate this word, but carpe diem, you know, overused, Mm -hmm. but really, why not? Let's do it. Yeah, sure. Well, it it sounds like you're not going to tell us exactly what you're talking about. You're you're too too secretive. You you haven't you haven't uh, fallen for our cunning questions. Well, Um, I I I thought I've actually given you way more information than I've ever given. That's pretty good. Eight project, eighteen movements in an attic. What could it? You know, I'm going to be uh, you know looking up in George's attic. It could like it could be absolutely anything. (laughs) Having having been to that office, there's abs- there's the coolest stuff everywhere. You know when you see on eBay, Felix, you know a trinket or a, or a stopwatch from the Olympics, or you know a Hoya timer, or it's it's, it's everything is there. So I'm genuinely fascinated with what this I, could be. Anything, huh? You know, you know, you say that you like you you see in my office like some crazy stuff. You have to, and and I'm sorry to sound like I'm I'm an advert for this, but you have to check out two things I checked out on Tuesday of this week, and I know this is coming out later, but two things I checked out. Right. One of them is the AP Museum. I went around the Edmar Puget oh, cool. Museum um, in Switzerland, and Jesus Christ, that was just amazing. I mean, that is absolutely. It's cool as it's as cool as cucumber. It's, it literally is one of those things. You walk around, and you're just like, oh wow, oh wow, oh wow. You know, and everything's interactive, and it's it's a really good. You know, if you look at um, my Instagram, you'll see in the stories, and it says Switzerland. You'll see, I, I was like a kid in a candy store, and then I went to the IWC um, uh, new shop in Zurich, and and that was really like everything from the. The gin was IWC racing gin, and and there was a beer bottle, and it was it, everything just felt so connected that you were just like hmm. actually, you know. And Chris Granger, uh, you know, he knows how to design a store, and the experience there, you were just like, this is cool. And AP was in another level in its own way, and it's just, and you know, I think sometimes when you experience the watch brand in a different light, you just go, wow. And I think that's what I love, you know, and going to, you know, my my heaven, my heaven of all heavens is the Tag Heuer Museum. Um, you know, sitting in there with Catherine, chatting and going through different watches. That's my heaven. But when I went to the AP, I was like, wow, you know, there's there's a it's another cool experience. Yeah, a hundred percent. Like I've I've had the the pleasure to go to a few different sort of buildings, and you're, you're absolutely right. You do get such a different appreciation for the for the brand and the people that work there. That really, you know, it's different to wearing just a watch on your wrist. It's sort of I can see why you know they want to try and get people to experience that side of it as well. Definitely, definitely. Um, now I've got sort of a follow up from Andy's question. Like we were talking about, you know, you're working with James Thompson. We've spent, you know, time, you know, singing the praises of um, the dial artist and, and King Nerd and all these guys. What is it that you like about working with other people? Um, I think I, I think it's nice to have. Well, firstly, it's nice to work with friends. Um, secondly, you know, we are a very small voice, and you know. It's nice to have another voice alongside us. Um, it's also understanding in my limitations, uh, understanding you know each person's limitations of what and and working together so then we we can do some crazy stuff together. And I think that's something you know I, I think a lot of people are ego about you know oh you know I can't do this or I can't do this. I, I I'm not that way and you know I. I've learned in the Japanese way, I'm, you know, I've, I've worked with Hiroshi Fujiwara and a few other Japanese mm, brands, very cool. uh, uh, brands um, and, you know, some other other people that are absolutely amazing. Um, and I, I always think that, you know, collaborations, it, it's when we were doing collaborations, we've done it from day dot almost. So I've always done a collaboration. Mm. I always feel that it works if we both feel a little bit of pain, we both feel all the glory. And, you know, it takes time to do a collaboration um, and it takes effort on both sides and it's a back and forth and you're going, oh, this is this, this is that. But at least you're in a place where you go, you know, together we love something together. 
that's a very good answer, George. And I think we share a similar sentiment with sort of the people we we get on the show. Uh, what I want to dive into now is, you know, we've talked a lot about customizing other people's watches. Yeah. Uh, I I know sort of a couple of years ago, you, you launched sort of your own line of watches and that sort of kicked off with the Mayfair. You've got the Mayfair Sport, the Mayfair Date. The one I think really made the biggest splash is that GMT collection, which you released a little bit more recently. Uh, and I think just yesterday you released the uh, the Bamford GMT Italian, which is that sort of black dial with creamy you yeah. know plots and hands and the sort of GMT split uh, in a bezel with the more burgundy red and like a flatter green, military green almost, which looks amazing. But why did you decide to sort of go down the path of you know your own line of watches and what are you trying to achieve with this part of the business? Um. I said earlier, it's about like seizing a day and enjoying. I, I, yeah. Honestly, that's how I, I, I was like, I want to do this. I, I want to manufacture mm. my own watch. Um, I think that it, it, it gives us um, uh, more of a path of our own, uh, you know, doing our own thing. I, I, it, but it's also, you know, I, I, I love designing. I love designing a, uh, uh the dials and i love designing for customers but i also like i i wanted to kind of put me onto a watch of what what would i want what you know what the watch would i want mm. uh the mayfair the mayfair came out of that was our service watch to start off with it was an asymmetrical uh-huh. service watch um and we did a hundred of these as a service watch and cool. in so what happened was Two of our clients, uh, and I think it was actually three of our clients, um, they brought their watches in for service. And one of them, actually, um, and I'm, he, if he ever listens to this, he will know who he is. Um, but one of our clients um, trapped his watch in a helicopter door, as you do. Uh, <laughs> sure. And his watch, um, and he was in England, and he phoned us up and he said, I've just trapped it it's damaged blah 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 blah. and i rushed a mayfair uh, over to him and said i'll take your watch and i'll 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 bring it back to you when are you landing back and he said i'm landing back in uh, two hours time he had the mayfair on his wrist two hours time he he um he came back and we put the watch back on his wrist and he went and he said um uh i want 10 of those mayfair watches and Ten. Then, then it started spreading, and it. So this watch that was never meant to be sold; it was just meant to be part of the business, and we were meant to just kind of loan them out. Um, we we got rid of all of them in the space of about two weeks, from all these clients cool. just going, "I want it," and we're like, cool. um, "Are you sure?" And honestly, the f- original ones. They they were okay, but they were they were very much a service watch. So then I was like, Christ! And I and then we were like, okay, I really got to push the asymmetrical design. I've got to push the case design. So we kind of stepped everything up. And then I was like, we've got to launch. We've got to launch this watch. If people are wanting it, we've got to launch it. And so that's where it just started. It's just started by happenstance. But even the whole of my business has been happenstance. It's like, okay, someone else likes what I've done great then we'll do it mm-hmm. it's not like hey, you know very i'm cool. getting into you know bamford london i i didn't kind of go oh you know i've got to do this it was very much hey i want to do this and i thought it was actually you know bamford london to start off with was predominantly an accessory business and you know yeah. we were doing a lot more accessories we're still doing great accessories we've got the aluminium watch roll we've got the um leather watch rolls but we were doing cards and we we're doing loads of other things We've, we're not doing as much as that because the watches started demanding below that, mm. let's say, £2,000 price point. You know, the GMT hits at £1,100. Um, I know in Aussie dollars, I, I'm, I can't uh, do the transfer. About 1850 But But, you know, for me... I've checked. <laughs> um, but for me, that's... that, And I, the GMT, really, I... Every time I travelled... I had different. I had I had two or three different styles of those dual time watches, and every time I travelled, and I before all of this happened, I travelled extensively. I mean, massively extensively. Mm-hmm. So 
Um, and every every time I got to a hotel room, I'd knock the bezel, and and I'd be out by an hour or two hours, and I'd phone home, and my wife would be like, "Good morning," and it would be like, and mm-hmm. and it would be like, "You you phone me at four o'clock in the morning? What the hell?" <laughs> And so I was like, well, I want to have a GMT where it's an internal rotating bezel with a very, very tight yep. um, screw system on, the, on uh, and that's where it's the asymmetrical retro, um, uh, retro inspired watch. Uh, and, uh, you know, I kind of call it a modern retro inspired watch. And, and, you know, I love the GMT idea of having that dual time and having that internal rotating bezel. Now, because I'm saying to you is I, I love watches and i love how they're made the internal rotating bezel idea definitely not my idea but i love the mm. idea and i i looked at the tag Heuer ring timer um mm. the, the muhammad yep. ali and when you looked at how the how they designed that internal bit we we took an idea off that and that's how that ring works so to me, very I'm cool, learning, cool. and I'm learning. And this GMT for me was was something I, I really, really love. I, I, the Italian, uh, it's nicknamed the Italian, is the uh, red and green mm. with the ivory. Um, uh, I mean, someone said to me it's off white, but I kind of love the ivory because I don't know why. But, uh, but I love how the Italians come through. There is a blue and brown that we've also got with a brown leather age strap. And for me, nice. they're so freaking cool. Um, and, you know, we've got the original colors. You know, I always I always love blue and orange together. So we did that, the blue and white, the orange and gray, and then our signature Banff Aqua Blue. And that's also something else. We, we really, you know, I spent a year and a half developing the Aqua Blue for our business because I wanted it to pop off against black. Hmm. It's a very famous famous blue for for the for the Bamford family George you're gonna have to send us out a couple to uh to get hands on with and and do a review because these are an interesting value proposition sort of at you know sub two thousand dollars GMT I think they've got selected movements 40 millimeters we'll link up sort of the the shop to let the listeners kind of see what we're talking about but yeah I'd love to check these out in the and when you say it's it's an SW 330 movement it's a bulletproof movement Mm. it is a very very reliable movement yeah, it's a forty yeah, millimeter case. It's but it wears. What it's what I love is it's a deceptive case, and I, you know I could say a retro modern. It's it really has you know and and so to the point that my mother is wearing a GMT. Um, yes, she's my mother, um, but she's wearing one of my GMTs. She she said it's one of the best watches she's she's worn. She said I like the lightweightness of it. I like how it fits on my wrist. Now it's a forty millimeter watch. If I put another 40 millimeter watch on her wrist, she would go, that's too big. And then I put mm. it on my wrist and it feels, it feels like a big watch. And it, it sounds strange, but it, it's kind of morphs in two ways. Love that. Well, on that note, on that note, George, uh, we've, it's evident now after sort of nearly an hour of chatting to you and I already know this, but you are a very, very passionate watch collector. Mm. Uh, you know, I think you have, you know, described yourself as a little bit of a magpie when it comes to yeah. watches. Uh, I know you have a very extensive collection. So what I want to hear is, you know, do you have any particular themes within the watches that you like to personally collect? Um, whether it's, you know, GMTs or Hoyer, you know, dash clocks or stopwatches, but how would you describe your sort of personal taste in watches? Uh, um, I, I I did describe myself as a magpie. I really am. I, I collect I collect <laughs> Hoyer uh, dash timers. Every time I see one, I'm I'm I, I you know I'm an eBay fi- finder, and I I spend a maximum about two hundred quid, um, and then I mount them on the wall for the office. Um, and I've got different um, stopwatches from Jaeger to Omega to Breitling to Hoyer. I've got mixtures of loads of different ones because I I love finding them. Um, I. I just, I describe myself, I go through different, different realms. Um, you know, at the moment I'm, I'm looking at digital watches. Um, I don't know why. Um, I'm also looking at the beta 21 style watches as well. Um, and I, I do know why when I went around the AP museum, I saw their beta 21 yellow gold, uh, AP watch. And I was just like, 
I don't know why, but that's just so effing cool. Um, and mm. it, like, I gotta want to steal it. And the amount of security there wasn't going to let me steal it. So that was the problem. <laughs> um, but what I would say to you is that um, that kind of hap. I I I kind of look at things like bullheads, and you know, I've got a yep. few different bullheads. And I went through a massive, massive point of looking at bullheads. And then um, I've got surf, uh, you know, I've got that surf timer or spirit um, timers from Breitlinger. And then, you know, Panerai's, I've got a few little Panerai's. And, and I, I, I really, I, I love understanding how they're working. I love how they look. Um, uh, and if you look to my collection, there is no rhyme or reason. Um, it's the same with cars. I, I, I love things because I love them and I don't give a shit if anyone doesn't like them. And that's yeah, my right. thing, it's a good mindset, you yeah. know, because then it's me, it's my thing. Mm. And that's where I think then it doesn't matter if they go up or down. You know, someone said to me, um, the beginning of all this happened, they said, Oh, you know, your watches are worth nothing today. they not my, not Banff watch department, but my own collection. I went to them and I said, I don't care. And they went, what do you mean you don't care? And I said, because I would never sell them because they're mine. That's amazing. What I want to ask you now, George, is, you know, it's, you've just said it then, but you have a, uh, you and I share something and it's the way we like to wear our watches yeah. and, you know, that's no stickers and it's wearing them and it's scuffing them. And you know, I, I remember that first time we actually met in person and you sort of handling, handing me literally a pile of watches uh, just check these out. You know, I think you just come back from a holiday or something and you've taken five or six watches with you. And I was like, this is really cool. What I want to hear, and I think you can give some really cool perspective on is your kind of ethos uh, or values when it comes to owning things like cars and watches. Okay, I, I, uh, I know what you're, you're talking about. I'm, I hate show ponies. And what I mean show ponies are things that stay in a safe and they come out, out every blue moon and someone says, you've got to see this. Because then I think that people are scared of wearing it. I, I, I instantly, as soon as I get the watch, I, I got the manufacturer's edition Zenith watch, the beautiful El Primero watch, and it came on a beautiful uh, crocodile strap. It was beautiful blue, matched the dials and all these things. And I thought to myself, no, I'm going to change the strap. Instantly, I changed the strap, and I and and I'm I, you know as the, my watchmakers say, I'm a little bit heavy-handed. So I did the first <laughs> guff mark, and I was happy about that. Now I'm not happy with the strap I put on it because it's not as good as the strap that they put on it. But I still changed it, and I and I wear it, and you know I've already put a few dents on it, and I'm like that's mine, and you know and and it's kind of like that. I I, I look at things, and I think. If you don't appreciate it on your wrist or if you don't appreciate driving it, then don't have it. You know, go and buy, go and buy a piece of art that you can put on the wall and just put it up on the wall. You know, mm, we're, 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 we're having mechanical things that need to be worn and used. And that's where I think it's got a beat. It's got a heartbeat that we need to listen to. And, we, you know, a car has an engine that needs to, needs to come alive. If you don't, if you don't use it in that way, then it's kind of, for me, but this is me. I mean, you know, I've got friends and I've got clients that, you know, are really like very like, no, no, it never comes out. Never, you know, I want to keep the Mars down. I want to do this. I want to do that. And I'm like, okay, can we go for a drive? Oh, no, 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 no. It's not the right day for it. And, you know, I'm like, but I want to experience these things. Do you know what I mean? Hundred percent. So I think you've. I've got a, a question that I think you are maybe you know uniquely positioned to ask, given that you've, you know, you're clearly a, a passionate collector. You've got a you know a business, and you've you know been around for a while. What do you think is missing from the watch industry at the moment? Look, I think because of what's happened, um, you know, I look at the watch industry and I think the watch industry at the moment is, um, I think some brands are, are, are rocking it and knocking it out of the park. I think they, those are, mm. those are the disruptor brands. Um, and I, I'm working with 
majority of the disruptor brands that are really doing stuff all i'm friends with the disruptor brands and what i mean sure. is they are they're starting to push push the envelopes because they're realizing that on social media um all of our voices are, are equal um so mm. you know you have to kind of you now have to push what you're doing and how you're doing it um but um if i look at um what's needed to be i th- i think that I, I i think personalization is is key i you know I, as I've, i it's because it's my pet pet thing mm-hmm. but i also would say to you is i think that um we you know watches i i i i'm probably kicking myself in the teeth because i i i love that we've done a steel gmt but i look at what yep. cases and watch things steel gold you know there's only a few watch brands that are really pushing the boundary of of casing and you know yep. i think to myself is why is it that we hold a platinum watch up in such a high regard when it's an old material and you yep. know so i but that's just me i you know i i i i look at it and i think why why are we why are we really holding it up there is it because of weight well you know there's other things you know look at what we've just done with the superconductor this is a material yeah. that is nirobium and copper together nirobium i'm like it's never been that that and a watch has never been discussed before and superconductor mm. has never been discussed before on that probably cost more than platinum Per well, as well, right? yeah, yeah. Thank you for mentioning that. <laughs> Not cheap. Um, but what I would say to you is that's where I I think that a lot of brands, you know, why 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 is it that when you look at um, so the Defy Lab from Zenith, yeah. that aero aluminium, I mean that case is so freaking future that literally the world hasn't caught up. The movement in it is so freaking future that the world hasn't caught up yet. Yeah. Now that's what I love. And you're asking what should brands do? They should be doing that. You look at the Zenith movement. You know, Mm. their chronograph movement, uh, you know, is the fastest chronograph in the world. Now, any other watch brand doing that you know, let's say one of the big watch brands, if they they did that, and Zenith is a big watch brand, but any other watch, they'd charge millions for that watch. And, you know, yeah. you look at the price of a Zenith and you're like going, wow, I've got the fastest chronograph mm-hmm. in the world. Yeah, that's incredible. Do you, think, do you think Zenith is a little bit underappreciated? Hell yes. And, and Jared Perigo. I think both of them, if you look at both the brands, these are these are kind of like superstars. They are doing things that, that you just go, wow. It's why, why I love working with it. Zenith, for me, you, you know, you see their auction results. You see what they're doing. And they are pushing. Yeah. The Defy has really defied, you know, all odds. It really has done something new. And you know, So potentially it's a, a case of appreciating what we, uh, what we do have and the brands that are really out there sort of pushing innovation, you know, in the form of right. movements and materials and, uh, daring to, you know, be a little bit more brave with their designs and products. Well, you know, when Richard Mill came out with, you know, his watches, he pushed the boundary straight off the bat. And I, when I, and this was ages ago, when I was mm. there, I thought, Christ, this is going to be the future. I could imagine all watch brands moving to new materials sooner, sooner than later. And Hublot was the one that really answered that call, but a lot of other brands didn't. What do you What do you think about Hublot? Are you a fan? Of course, I'm a fan. It's uh, Jean Claude Beaver and and uh, Mr. Guadalupe. Of course, I'm a fan. Um, uh, I, I I actually have a, a Midas, so one of the original um, Hublots, um, uh, and I, I just because I, I found one and I was just like, and it was just so freaking cool. Um, Honestly, yeah, I love what Hublot's do- doing because it, it it wakes up every morning and says, "How can we be different?" And and yeah. you know, I, I got asked um, a while ago, and I and I, you know, I was talking to uh, 
to them a while ago and I said uh, and we were chatting about personalization and and Mr. Guadalupe and, and also myself, we both came to the realization that we couldn't do personalization because he is already almost doing that by doing the limited editions, do it, you know, moving so quickly that, yep. you know, holding on, it, it, you know, it, we, we, we couldn't, we couldn't do, uh, do it as well. A little bit tricky. What do you think of the, uh, the Sang Blue releases? Um, I, th- I, I think very cool. Um, yeah. What do you think? Yeah, very cool. We're, we're sort of uh, friends with uh, Maxime, who's the, I guess, owner of Sang Blue. So Felix and I are probably a little bit biased, but that's sort of one that was most recently released and, and jumps to mind. Felix, what do you think? Yeah, I'm a big fan, but the one that I've, I've really been thinking about recently is their millennial pink one in uh, that sort of dusky aluminium case. Yeah. Like, you, you know, you're, you're 100% right there as far as brands that are pushing not just the design and the personalization, but also like legitimate material innovation. Yep. I think there aren't that many others that have as like Richard Mill, of course, but, but they, you know, the impact of Hublot is huge. Like they're massive. Hublot wakes up every morning and goes, we're going to be different today. You know, you, you kind of go, yeah. So we're going to do scratch resistant gold. And you go, oh, yeah. that's amazing. And then you think they're going to do thousands of watches in scratch-resistant gold. And then they come out with a red red ceramic. And you're like going, what? what, what? And then, then yeah. you know, a few, you know, then it's like, oh, yes, then, then we're doing sapphire crystal. Boom. You know, and it's just like. Really? All in 12 months. Right. It's like, you know, and, and then, oh, yeah, let's do the millennial pink or the, you know, you know the blue or the boom. And, oh, yeah. And then. Ten minutes later, we're going to do digital, and you're just like, yeah. you're like, oh my god, you guys are on fire. The thing that I love about them, though, is that, like you're saying about sort of everyone, you know, revering platinum, they're not afraid. Like they know that not everyone's going to, you know, I'm, I'm air quoting everyone yeah. is going to, you know, be down for what they do, but they don't, they don't care. They're like, okay, you don't like our watches. Scroll on. Totally fine. You know? And and that's the thing is, I, I also would say to you is I think critics, um, I, I have a, I think, you know, I'm, I, some people like, like us, some people hate us. And some think, uh, think that, uh, you know, I, I'm the devil incarnated and who the hell am I? But what I would say to you is that at least I'm pushing the boundary and doing something different. And I think the same with Hublot. They're pushing the boundary. They're doing something different. And, they have got a clientele that loves what they do. And, you know, in this world, why do you want to be someone that follows a trend? Why don't you actually be a part of doing something different and wearing something that makes you happy? And if a standard simple watch makes you happy, then then so be it. But if you want to have something individual and something that's you, make it you. Perfect. That, that's very well put. And look, just to add to that, George, after you know an hour plus chatting with you, I don't think anyone can argue the passion uh, that you. you personally have and that you bring to this, and you know your intentions, uh, you know, really pure and, and and I think wonderful with what you're trying to do to the industry and do with your products and you know the experience you're trying to give people. And yeah, I think we are very close to the the sort of instant feedback yeah. and the nature of you know social media and online comments and that sort of stuff. And it's really important not to get lost in that and remember sort of the, the purity that you're going out there with these, um, these products and, and brands like Hublot and Richard Mill that, you know, are, are legitimately trying to push boundaries and innovate and do something different and that it's okay not to like something if, yeah. if, if it's, if you don't, that, but the person that made it does and the person that bought it does and really that's all that matters. So what I want to wrap yeah. on, George, is because we're cautious of, cautious of time is we, we finish every episode and we ask the guests for, you know, recommendations on things that they've been liking. So potentially something you've been reading, watching, listening to, what have you got for us? Oh, reading, watching. Um, okay. Um, reading um what have i read recently that i thought was bloody amazing um honestly uh and i hate saying this because i I, i've said it a few times i read shoe dog again and i thought god no (laughs) i mean wow how freaking cool is that 
Um, and uh, and then uh, Ready Player One. I read the book. It's better than the movie. So good. Um, the yeah. movie for me, I, I of course the movie is good, but the the book, the references to great music, great arcade, yeah. my childhood. I, I mean, and and childhood that I wanted. So for me, that that's kind of my my two things that I keep on re-listening. So reading or listening, I, I'm one of those people that kind of just absorbs it again and again and again because I, I like the nuances of Ready Player One. Um, and then watching, um, what have I watched recently that I thought was kind of interesting? Um, I, I, I've, I've, I've kind of been a, a massive uh, documentary uh, person. So I, I would probably say Inside Bill, Bill's Brain really kind of, I loved that. And I know it's a bit of an old one, but I, I really like that. Um, and then um, there was, uh, I'm just trying to think of something else. Um, you know, you've got to say Ford versus Ferrari. Um, because yeah, for me, cars, watches, um, coolness. Um, it made me just go, God, I'd love to have been back in those days and steal everything. Um, did I, did I say that? I, I wanted to kind of be that person that just turns up onto onto the set and like with a truck and just goes, "Oh yeah, I'll take that." Oh, oh, I like this. So I, you know, so I think that was kind of a, a you know a real like uh, when I watched it, I was just like, "This is really cool." And I, I went. It was me and my father went to watch it, and we were just we came away and we were just oh, like, I "This it. is." I, I loved every minute of it. Um, and you know what was really cool was after the fact my father telling me about the race days and, and, you know, reminiscing about some of the things. And I thought, yeah, okay, that's cool. Love that, George. Those are great recommendations. We'll, we'll link those all up for the listeners. George, thank you so much for, for you know, sparing this time and, and joining us on the show. It's been, a, it's been a treat and I think this is going to be a really eye-opening and insightful uh, look in, into your, you know, wonderful brain and, and, and sort of your uh, passion. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much for the time. Um, and, guys, thank, thank you for listening. I'm sorry that it's been an hour and whatever minutes, um, but I, I think that we could wax on forever. Um, but it is really – good. it's so much fun chatting with you guys. And I can't wait to see you to give you a high five or, you know, I, I'm slightly a bit of a hugger, so I probably would give you a hug. Especially Love it. At the moment. Hug it out. Uh, but, uh, but I would say to you is that, you know, I can't wait to see you over the side or over your side and just actually hang out and, and just chat and shoot the shit. Love it, George. Well, we'll catch you next time. Perfect. Thanks a lot, guys. And there you go, Andy Green. George Bamford, what a gent, what a character, and what a fascinating story. Yeah, it's also the nicest introduction that I've ever received on the show, which, considering we've done nearly 40 episodes together, Felix, lift your game. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, yikes. Uh, He's a legend. He's a legend. I don't know, and, what, uh, I don't know what to say I'm to a, that, Andy Grade, so I'm not going to deal with it. I'm just going to say move forward. Uh, thank you to everyone listening. Please support Major yep. Tom Media. Please support our sponsors. Buy yes, some Nomos, decals. check them out. Check out. Oh, yeah. Check out. Check out the new Nomos Lambda. Yeah, sure. Check out uh, the decals. Stickers are for flippers. Um, mm-hmm. Always. Check thank you, out. George. Oh, yeah, thank you. Have we, yeah. Check thank you, George. Out. Thank you, George. He's a busy man, so we do appreciate him taking the time. Yeah, for, uh, he, he for was. A chat like uh, that. You know, he did take a lot of time. It was very generous. Um, if you want to tell us how much you loved our interview with George Bamford, you can email us at otthepodcast at gmail.com. You can comment yes. on our social media to the same effect at ot.podcast or what you could also do is give us a review on you know google or apple podcast five stars i love george banford that'll do nicely but if not yeah and tell your friends yeah be sure to be telling your your mates your homies your nan homies and your nan are your your nan yeah. have lots of homies she's our list of base is diverse mate it's all all areas and corners of the world i think we need to go and we're, so, yeah. we're slowly losing it Bye.